And welcome to this much anticipated webinar powered by the China Project. We are so delighted you join us today to delve into the subject that has been on the minds of many business leaders, data analysts, policymakers, and academics alike. Our topic today is open source intelligence in crisis. I'm Lizzie, your host for the day, and I've been in the China journalism space for over two years now after a decade of training as an academic economist. I'm thrilled to be moderating this incredibly relevant and timely discussion. But first, let me introduce our two amazing panelists. First, we have Skip. Skip is a true open source research practitioner with a deep understanding of China. Skip pursued his studies in China at the University of Leiden and Xiamen, uh, specializing in China. He now shares his expertise by teaching courses on Chinese online research techniques, aiming at assisting researchers, academics, and business professionals in harnessing the potential of Chinese online language sources. Skip now represents iIntelligence, a Switzerland-based company that excels at the convergence of intelligence foresight strategy and policy. Welcome, Skip. Next up, we have DJ. DJ is a China analyst who played a pivotal role on the state-sponsored threats team at C4ADS. His work involves harnessing the power of high-value data sets and open source intelligence to delve into ma ma matters such as malign investment, influence operations, and other threats emanating from the Chinese government. Before joining C4ADS, DJ accumulated valuable analytical experience in both the public and private sectors. He collaborated closely with international trade specialists at the U.S. Department of Commerce, where he translated China's five-year plans. In addition, DJ also contributed his expertise to a wide array of due diligence and litigation activities during his tenure at Portman Square Group. DJ is an alumnus of NYU Shanghai, and he furthered his education by earning a master's degree in applied intelligence from Georgetown University. Welcome, DJ. So, um, so uh, I just just wanted to check our panelists' audios are all functioning. I think Skip, your connection is a little, uh, is a little, uh, is a, so. Uh, Skip, can you just confirm you can hear me? Skip, can you can you confirm you can hear me? Uh, to the China project team, I think we just lost Skip on the audio, but I'm gonna continue. So we're gonna start today's conversation by focusing on what's currently going on in China's. Uh, data control space. Uh, the media has lately focused a lot on China's recent tightening control over its data. In this context, some key events to note include China's introduction of its data transfer rules and laws in July 2020. 2022, which came roughly a year after China scrutinized the DD. Uh, in September of 2022, we saw wind uh, information systems uh, that was asked to limit overseas data access, and that caught significant media attention. And by March of this year, the CNKI academic database restricted some modules, and the US firm Minsk Group was then raided. And as recently as April and May of this year, we also saw the enactment of new anti-espionage laws and raids on Bain Capital and Capvision offices. But when we talk to insiders in China, uh, they paint a more nuanced picture. Many see this as less of a full-scale crackdown and more as involving legal landscape. China is now treating data exports much like physical exports, requiring a license for the same. Despite all the headlines we see in the media, I think it's important to note that platforms like Wind, Info, Wande, and CNKI, Zhivang are still largely accessible. So we're going to start uh, today's conversation with a series of overarching questions. Then we're going to get to some audience questions uh, pre-submitted to us. We also welcome uh, questions as we go along. Please just submit them via the questions and answers 
function you see in the Zoom uh, window that you're currently in. And we will try to get to as many of them by the end of today's webinar. So I'm going to start with Skip. Skip, can you please shed light on how those recent data restrictions we just mentioned in China are complicating the due diligence process for foreign firms planning either joint ventures, mergers, or in some cases, acquisitions. Okay, so um, our team just informed me that uh, Skip is not here. So I'm gonna turn to DJ first. DJ, your research focuses a lot on the use of high value data set and open source intelligence to study malign investment and other threats. I wonder if you can help us understand the broad implications of those restrictions. How do you think limited data access from China exacerbate concerns over malign investment, defense trade, and intellectual property security? issues. Yeah, sure. Uh, before I continue, I just want to make sure I'm coming through clearly. Yes, your audio is perfect. Thank you. Awesome. Great. Well, first of all, thanks for having me today. Uh, Chinese publicly available information is kind of like my bread and butter here at C4ADS, so I'm more than happy to chat about this. Um, so yeah, the, I'd say the limited access to data in the Chinese data environment raises concerns over a variety of threats, including malign investments, wartime defense trade of dual-use goods, influence operations and soft power projection, uh, research and IP theft, human rights violations, and so much more. So let's say that a university in Europe, for example, is trying to establish a joint research facility uh, for aerospace technology with a Chinese defense university. And it turns out that the Chinese defense university conducts research for the Chinese military. The European university may want to reconsider the collaboration if they knew who the Chinese university's end user is. So we've seen a lot of people and organizations in academia and in the corporate world end up in these seemingly innocuous situations simply because the data in this environment is scarce and they just simply didn't know who exactly they were working with. In other words, the climate of the Chinese data environment is leading to preventable breaches in security, corporate security, research security, economic security, and even national security. So I'd say that organizations like C4ADS rely heavily on the Chinese data environment to investigate these issues, and we leverage a variety of data verticals to do so. So corporate data, trade data, judicial, procurement, uh, patent, property, concession, employment, and even leaked data. There's just so many different types of data that we work with in this space. And even though we've been able to capture a lot of it, Sometimes I feel like we've merely scratched the surface. So we've noticed that the amount of publicly available information in this space has steadily decreased in the past five years. And while the opacity makes our job a little more difficult, it's certainly not impossible. It actually even encourages us to become more creative in our data collection strategy, which is cool. So when it comes to data from Chinese sources, you have to get it while the getting is good because there's no telling how long it will be accessible for. We've seen this happen to Chi Cha Cha, a once reliable source of Chinese corporate data that became pretty restricted, restricted in the past year. The silver lining is that when one site closes, another one emerges. So it's all about identifying those alternative sources of equally valuable and equally reliable data. Fabulous. Thank you so much, DJ. So I see Skip is back online. Uh, follow up from uh, the question I just uh, I just put to uh, DJ. Skip, do you think those data restrictions will have a knock-on effect on other government and maybe third-party data sources? What do you think is the likelihood of a domino effect in the context of future data limitations? Um, I think by, so good to be back, by the way, I love the internet. Um, I think by restricting mainstream commercial data to be created from abroad, I think the effect is going to be twofold, like a twofold domino effect, if you will. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, um, I think this will create opportunities for companies which have soft connections in China. When I mean soft, I mean unofficial. For instance, pulling corporate data um, from Chinese websites can be done easily if you have someone in China with a Chinese phone number, which they have, or abroad with a Chinese phone number. And then that pre person can query the internet to find or retrieve that data and push it forward to, right? Now this creates go-betweens and this model actually exists in quite a few countries already. Simply put, someone can easily 
just send whatever information is required to someone in China and they uh, pull it from the internet and send it back. It's another link in the chain uh, to get to the information, whether it's corporate, academic data, but it's still a very effective way to get to it, albeit a bit cumbersome, right? So the simple, this simple scheme actually um, also heightens the risk of the go-between in question in China to be perceived as probably breaking the law on a local level, right? So the other domino effect, or on the other hand, I also think that this is also going to present entities which do have licenses to pull data from the internet in China to witness an increase in demand of these services. So it also implies, I think, that researchers from any background are going to have to be creative to get to that data without using a data pool, right? If it dries out just by searching themselves, which requires knowledge on how to type and search in Chinese online, uh, which can seem intimidating due to the uh, linguistic, linguistic aspects of the language, uh, as well as how to navigate the Chinese internet. That, of course, that's what we're all about at the eye intelligence. And it's, it's not that difficult. Uh, it takes a bit of breaking the ice, uh, but still, it's quite possible, actually. Fantastic. So, DJ, what guidance do you have for our audience who are grappling with those data limitations? How can they identify and use still available trustworthy sources in this increasingly opaque environment? Sure. Yeah. Uh, my advice would be for companies, government agencies, universities, and other organizations in this space to take advantage of the scalable, low cost cost and non-resource intensive solutions to the data limitations. So just because the data appears to be limited and hard to find, it doesn't mean that it's not there. So from official government websites to third-party data aggregators, we're constantly identifying new sources of high-value data. Um, Chi Cha Cha is not the only source of Chinese corporate data. Similarly, CNKI is not the only source of Chinese academic data. And we've noticed that as these once reliable sources start to close, new ones appear with the same, uh, if not better data. That's why uh, I and others at C4ADS attach a lot of importance to data foraging and just seeing what's out there. Despite the limitations, the sheer amount of information that remains is quite staggering. Um, also, if you know what you're looking for and how to look for it, the data is essentially handed to you uh, basic search techniques in Mandarin, VPN services, uh, and the will to dig deep will take you quite far and at a relatively low cost, just as it has for us. So, for example, companies, universities, government agencies in China post a surprising amount of information on their official platforms, just like they do here in the States and elsewhere. If you want to identify shared facilities between a Western research institute and a Chinese defense university. You can do that. If you want to track shipments of integrated circuits between Shenzhen and Moscow, you can do that. If you want to scrape tender records where units of the PLA are listed as suppliers, you can do all of those things. It's all about knowing what you're looking for, where to look for it, and how to go about finding it. Fantastic. So I see we have a few audience questions on alternatives to Tea Cha Cha. We're going to leave those um, to the end. But uh, DJ, we're going to hear your thoughts on those questions. But I'm going to turn to Skip first. We also have a few questions on the CNKI database, which we know researchers in heart sciences have relied heavily on. And uh, people might remember back in 2013, there was a master's thesis on CNKI, which was pivotal for Indian uh, scientists researching uh, the origin of COVID-19. But under the new regulations in China, accessing those crucial information from outside China have become quite problematic, as a few of our, of, uh, of our webinar participants um, have pointed out in the Q&A box. Uh, Skip, can you discuss the ripple effects of those restrictions on other industries? Have those restrictions, especially on CNKI, uh, affected your work or your client's work? Can you share the strategies that you've been using to circumvent those limitations on CNKI database? Uh, yeah, sure. So this presents a, a pretty big problem due, uh, in order to get to that academic information, which is so important to the advancement of society, understanding how other uh, other um, uh, countries work and look at information and share information. 
Um, so with that, again, we talked about pools of data drying out. We talked a lot about um, corporate information pools drying out. In this case, we're looking at academic pools drying out as well, right? Uh, so this means that one, again, I, I echo uh, the, the thoughts of DJ, one has to uh, learn how to search online, just as we would in English, searching for data without going to these uh, data access points like ResearchGate, et cetera, and learning how to get to that data, right? Uh, that's going to be the same in Chinese. So you just have to switch. Well, I say you just have to, it might sound difficult, but it's pretty much the same systems or met methodology you have to apply when researching in a foreign language. And I would say that's researching in Chinese uh, as uh, intimidating as it might look with the different characters, et cetera, is probably one of the easiest languages to search in online. Coming back to your question, I think it means that you have to identify keywords, which is something we really uh, emphasize on, right? Uh, it's a bit like if you, um, if you would have a library card, for instance, and then the library card says, I don't like you anymore, you can't go in my library. Well, you still wanna read that book, right? It just means that you're gonna to have to look at other places where you can consume that information, other libraries, or have a look for other libraries and kind of make that uh, uh, anecdote. Fabulous. So DJ, we also have a question from one of our audience members. The question asks about how significant is the gap in the volume of data available inside versus outside China? Do you think, any of this restricted data will be re-available uh, to international users in the new future, or is this something more permanent? Are there sort of under the radar sources of Chinese data that our audience should be aware of that you've been uh, finding helpful? Sure, yeah, uh, great question. Um, in my experience, I've noticed that the gap in data availability inside versus outside of China is pretty significant, mm -hmm. uh, mostly because a lot of Chinese websites with high value data will require you to create an account with them in order to access the data it holds. Uh, and to create an account, you have to verify your identity uh, with a Chinese phone number. So folks in China who have that Chinese phone number um, would in theory be able to do this quite easily, whereas it's a little bit harder for us to do. Uh, so using VPNs, for example, has taken us quite far, but there are certain sites that require you to create an account with a Chinese phone number in the end. So regardless of where your internet traffic is coming from, you're gonna ultimately have to submit some sort of Chinese phone number. In terms of re-availability, I haven't seen any data-rich websites that were once accessible and reliable suddenly reappear with less restrictions. However, I have seen data migrate to other newer sites, right. uh, perhaps ones with similar names. For So for example, as Cha Cha, Tianyan Cha, Ai Chi Cha were starting to close, other third party uh, corporate data aggregators in the space were opening up with the same corporate data containing the same corporate identifiers that we look for. So, Chinese names, unified social credit codes, uh, registered capital, shareholders, directors, et cetera. It's possible that these alternative third-party data sources were scraping from Chi Cha Cha itself, knowing that Chi Cha Cha would one day become inaccessible. So when it comes to under the radar sources of Chinese data, first of all, there are several. And second, they aren't so under the radar after all. And we've been able to identify these alternative sources of high value data through basic internet searches and just some simple data foraging. I see. Just, you know, DJ, I wanted to step back from the nitty gritty details of data restrictions a little bit. I wanted to talk about perception a little bit. Um, you know, do you believe that this negative image being reinforced by these restrictions is something that the Chinese government is aware of? Do you think Beijing is cognizant of the global impact of their recent actions are having, not just on policy researchers, but on academic researchers in general? Do you think there are, uh, there are indications that they, they might take steps to improve the situation? Sure, yeah. I. I don't specialize in political analysis, but I, I don't think Beijing cares about the negative mm -hmm. image being reinforced by these restrictions. If they did, then we wouldn't uh, be operating in this opaque data environment. They seem to make an attempt uh, to be transparent in the 14 five-year plans and other uh, publicly available national plans. But I found that it's kind of difficult to draw tight conclusions from these. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And I think the data in this environment or lack thereof speaks for itself. I'd like to think that economic growth and data transparency go hand in hand. Um, so if economic growth truly is a priority for the party, then we should, in theory, have a data environment that facilitates and reflects that. Uh, we know that the limited access to data is making it more difficult for foreign companies to do business with China and to do their due diligence. So in this way, perhaps the negative image is warranted. Surely Beijing is aware of these effects, but in my work, I haven't seen any indication of the situation noticeably improving. With that said, we've been able to uh, develop some pretty replicable solutions to the limited data access, and they've already been proven to be pretty successful. So all to say that uh, not all hope is lost. I see. Thank you so much, DJ. So speaking of data transfer, Skip, I'm going to turn this question to you. Are your colleagues or partners in China generally willing or open to send data to you or overseas counterparts? I mean, I've heard stories for instance, of US-based academics reaching out to their Chinese colleagues for document sharing, because it's easier to do those from within China. Is this kind of collaboration potentially problematic or dangerous? Uh, are they also becoming increasingly restricted? So are professionals within China, whether in academic, trade, or finance, becoming more cautious about sharing data as part of their tangible projects or work? I think the first group that really got cautious with this are the persons uh, engaging in corporate research. And now we're seeing a pivot from that to the academic field, which is worrisome because like we stated before, it's so important to get that uh, those exchanges. So that means that not only corporate researchers, uh, but also journalists and academics in general need to be sensitized on the implications of data requests and data sharing with, uh, with their Chinese counterparts, right? Uh, as right. it might put the receiver uh in, in in hot waters right um from a research and more importantly a, an academics perspective I've, if i can just jump on this i think it's uh for those wishing to get more access to chinese data and really understand how that is if china is their bread and butter if that's what they're going to be focused on that is what they're looking at it also means that one would have to spend some time over there uh to get a taste of what is really readily available within the country? How do people engage with data coming from abroad? Are people reluctant getting that information? It does seem like they're getting a bit more reluctant and more aware that uh, they want to do some research if it is actually okay to do so, so right? So I do. it's actually one of the things, and I think uh, some of you might, might agree with me, is that I, I actually encourage any China scholar professional to do regardless of the present data restrictions, right? Now that the pandemic is over and everybody can travel quite freely, uh, do go over there and support to keep those lines of communications open and ex uh, culture ex uh, um, exchanges going, right? Um, in terms of implications of data sharing, it'll, um, I think it means that not only the receiver of the data needs to operate within the boundaries of the law or be aware of it, but also the sender of the information from outside of China something that's quite foreign uh, to us since in most instances, most information from uh, from abroad has always been quite readily uh, uh, accessible. I think it's going to be interesting to see how faculties in China are going to deal with an increase of unofficial requests, emails, peer-to-peer saying, hey, I can't get to K uh, CNKI. Uh, can you forward me that PDF, right? That document, I still need that for my research. You're going to see an increase of that demand which also means an increase of these faculties having really to think about if they're going to share that or not, uh, since these data points have become restricted to, uh, to uh, foreign entities. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Skip. So we also have a question from the audience on buying accounts from websites, uh, say, like Taobao. Um, what are some of the ethical concerns or potential issues associated with purchasing data from you know from the web like Taobao and how would you evaluate the quality of the data uh, from those online uh, you know basically e-commerce market is is it, it are, are they valid data uh, are they safe to have is 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 it ethical to be included in your research skip what's your, what's your thought on that it's a tricky one, right? Because when if it's sold on a on a second uh, second hand, you could call it a second hand marketplace, online right. marketplace, right? Uh, how how well do you know if 
the the person submitting that information to be sold online it's a pretty new concept selling uh selling academic information on a second hand website or first hand website uh it's 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 a tricky it's a gray area like so many areas with the chinese internet or china in in general whether it's uh the internet or politics that it's it's a gray area and you can't really put your finger on it but it's definitely something that people are going to have to be aware of like like I said, if you're outside of China, you want to access that information, go to Taobao and buy it, you might be okay. There might be no repercussions for you, uh, but there might be repercussions for the persons uh, submitting the data online or if if it's seen that people have actually been buying that data from Taobao, for example, I think. Fantastic. Um, another question from our audience on uh, basically how to obtain a Chinese phone number using uh, used to be used for verification. I'm going to direct this question to DJ. Um, our audience member asks whether online temporary Chinese phone numbers would use uh, would be useful to receive uh, you know messages at work for verification. Have you had experience with that? Yes, we've played around with trying to obtain some sort of Chinese SIM card to kind of you know run those verification checks on those sites with high value data. We've had very little luck with that. Um, you know, it's not super easy to obtain one, especially when you're in a place like the United States or somewhere else in Europe. Um, so that's just kind of a common obstacle we face. There's ways around it. Um, it's easier said than done, uh, mostly because you have to be in China to uh, obtain a Chinese phone number or a SIM card. That's technically the way, uh, the rules that you have to follow. You have to uh, submit some personal identifiers when registering for a Chinese phone number. And also those phone numbers will eventually expire. So it's hard to find a replicable solution to that problem. Um, you know, of course you could try and reach out to someone within China. Um, there, there's risks associated with that. Um, perhaps putting that person in some sort of danger. That's not a risk that, you know, we or other people in this space are willing to take. Um, that's just some important ethical dilemmas to keep in mind. Fantastic. Thank you so much, DJ. Another question for you, DJ. Um, how are financial services and banking sectors, I know those sectors heavily depend on data services. How are they coping with the data restrictions in China now? Sure. Yeah, another good question. So I would say that who to lend money to, who to do business with, who to hire from, these are difficult decisions to make when you don't have the data to support them. So nowadays in the China space, it's not enough to determine whether or not a vendor, a client, or a potential partner is a legitimate, well-managed business or institution. In this space, you also have to consider whether or not they're a state-owned enterprise, a front organization, a defense university, a company that relies on forced labor, a company that is run by former state bureaucrats. Mm -hmm. Um, basic corporate and economic activities like trade, joint ventures, mergers and acquisitions, setting an interest rate, pricing, hiring, background checks, they become burdensome when you can't do your standard due diligence. So I think financial institutions, insurers, banks, they're relying heavily on their partners in the private sector to overcome this, specifically relying on organizations like C4ADS and other nonprofits who specialize in these areas and are more familiar with the Chinese data environment. So we can't expect people to know how to navigate a Chinese government website or interpret a Chinese court record or even use Chinese social media platforms. But, you know, that's that's where we come in. Fantastic. So uh, we also have another question, which is related to this um, this idea of data provider uh, besides open source data. Um, the question is, is Singapore emerging as kind of a go-between in terms of data transfer? And when it comes to financial services, how would you compare what's happening with open source intelligence gathering versus data provided uh, by kind of a major for-profit data providers. And that goes in both directions, coming out of China and going in, uh, DJ. Yeah, Singapore has not come up in my research and analysis as a jurisdiction to find alternative Chinese data sources. I will say that we've worked heavily with mirrored data in the mm -hmm. past. Um, I would say that in general, most of the Chinese data I work with, it comes from 
one of three places, uh, official government websites, third-party data aggregators, and mirrored data sets. So let's take trade data as an example. If I'm trying to identify Chinese exports of dual-use goods, just as an example, I'll look for Chinese shipments um, that are mirrored in the import records of Russia, Myanmar, or another country or transshipment site of interest. Um, we've been doing this for a while now, um, especially since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and it's helped us identify previously undetected shipments of military equipment produced in China, which is pretty cool. And I think that's a good example of what you're referring to, you know, looking in mirrored data sets of other countries to find Chinese data that is mirrored elsewhere. I see. I see. Well, thank you so much. Uh, the next question is for Skip. Um, when it comes to access to overseas data from inside China, how would you describe the current situation and trend? You know, we know uh, people inside China have, have for years not been able to access Western news sites directly. But now we are seeing this trend of further restrictions on other kinds of specific Western data sources like U.S. econ data, financial data, or other databases from UN or IMF, which could potentially be very useful for Chinese researchers. What's a what's the current situation there? Uh, very interesting. So the very first thing people download when they have a smartphone is going to be WeChat and then a VPN or in that order. Uh, and it's a bit different than a few years ago. So back in the day, most VPNs downloaded outside of China or within China did the trick to access other than Chinese websites. Uh, when I was there, everybody was, was using ExpressVPN. That was the best, right? Some of you might have heard of it, right? And every once in a while, you get a message saying, hey, you need to download this plugin or this upgrade uh, to keep it working because the data regulators were enforcing restrictions or blocks on a VPN. It's a bit of a gray area. It's legal to have a VPN, but it's illegal to provide a VPN. Uh, just to, to give you an example, uh, when I was over there at university, there were these standalone terminals with a computer. You didn't have to log in, but there were built-in VPNs right at the university library, speci specifically made for not so much for the few foreign students that were there, but more for the uh, domestic students, Chinese students, to go online and consume information to in order to uh to write uh what they had to do right mm -hmm. um now this might not cut it these days uh because um to go about it is to download a vpn abroad the, the best way to do it is to download a vpn abroad but this is cumbersome if you're in china right they really have to struggle and find these ways around it and it's usually the what, what most people kind of figure out and share directly with their friends right there's a, there's a useful website actually called the uh the circumvention central cc.greatfire.org uh, and it's going to measure the vpn speed against other vpns in china and the best one for example i checked it out this week the top ones in terms of speed and stability uh for example are going to be blue cloud and astral too two vpns i've never heard about but uh it's um it's there's no cookie cutter way around it right people have to be creative to uh, go around it and get to that information which they need. Fantastic. So we have lots of questions on VPNs to use, uh, how to set up VPNs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, are there any safe VPNs besides what Skip just told us um, that have servers within mainland China? DJ, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I've come across um, a wide range of VPN services that I have personally used in my workflow, you know, just mm -hmm. to kind of see if accessing a specific data set is more feasible, you know, rerouting my internet traffic through another country. Um, you know, I think VPN services like Bright Data, NordVPN are good go-tos um, because you're able to kind of reroute your traffic through multiple different jurisdictions just to kind of see which one works best for your specific workflow or problem set. Um, but yes, definitely VPN services, a big part of my day-to-day -day here. Um, and they have been proven to be very successful when mining for that really high value data that we look for. Fantastic. We also have a couple of great questions on uh, research ethics and research safety. So the question from the audience is, 
you know, isn't this discussion giving Chinese authorities more clues about the gaps in their current control structure, which is already increasingly uh, strict, that they need to fill? Uh, in, in some sense, once we find out a way to get around those restrictions, then they can impose further restrictions on those loopholes. Um, is there any way to tell the line between doing due diligence and spying, which is, um, you know, under uh, in increasingly harsh punishment under current uh, China and anti Chinese anti uh, espionage law. And the audience also has a question on how should we describe our great mythologies uh, in accessing data in published research, or if doing that will put the access at risk. So Skip, I'm going to start with you. What's your thoughts on those? I think it's it's very uh, difficult to put your finger exactly on uh, why it restricts. I'll I'll go back to a more general question. Actually, uh, it's a question I ask myself quite often when I teach the corporate section of the course. So it's a question I get asked quite often by by people's in people in the course, asking why does it go to such extents to restrict corporate data? If they would make it more transparent, uh, people would be signing deals more quickly. There would be due diligence would be done quicker. KYC, KYB, know your customer, know your, know your, uh, your business would be done easier. So it's it's um, it, it. I don't have an answer for that. I don't know why uh, there isn't enough transparency. You would think they wouldn't want to make that to kind of advance uh, their business interests and, and advance. Uh, uh, international trade. So it's um um it's we sometimes or not only in the, in terms of data or corporate research, but in general, there's this perception that everything is top down and uh, and logical. It's not always, and uh, it's it it does take some time and research to kind of figure out uh, when is something going to be restricted and when are they going to lift a restriction or why do they actually uh, restrict things? They it's not uncommon that whether it's politics or, or, or data or something else that uh, it baffles all the researchers that it does a 180 without warning anyone, right? So it's uh, very unpredictable. I see. Well, thank you so much. Uh, DJ, any thoughts on that? How should we think about our safety when it comes to research and uh, being, being specific about the way we use to access those data? Yeah, you got to be smart when you're operating in this space. It's important to not show your entire hand. Uh, because if you if you do that, you know the site that you're trying to scrape data from it might close. Um, you know, I I try to be careful about what I make um, uh, publicly known. Um, obviously, we want these things to be in the spotlight. Uh, specifically, instances of malign investments, defense trade, and other issues that I referred to earlier. Um, you also have to consider that the data we're working with in this space could be obfuscated or incomplete. That's why it's important for uh, analysis to be done by analysts who are language enabled and who have high context uh, to, to kind of mitigate these issues. Uh, I think I could also talk about leaked data here. You kind of have to take leaked data with a grain of salt um, and also pay attention to the data provenance. Um, you know, where exactly is that data coming from? Is it reliable? Because we want to be comfortable standing by the analysis that we ultimately conduct on that data. So I would say my biggest points here are just, you know, being public with the knowledge that you're gathering and the data that you're capturing, but also being smart about it and not spilling all the beans. I see. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we have another question from our audience on uh, language proficiency. I'm going to direct this to skip. For many of the still accessible sources, proficiency in Chinese is usually necessary to understand and use those data properly. Are there quality English language sources that you would recommend skip? Uh, skip? So the common consensus is that one has to be fluent in a language in order to find information uh, in that language. That might be the case when you're physically reading a book or consuming information, right? It's not so much the case online. There are so many tools out there that have really made us crack languages. Uh, very, The one everybody comes to mind of is would be Google Translate. Careful there, because as one of the things I, I, I have, we emphasize in our courses, whether it's Arabic, Russian, or Chinese courses, is be careful with over-reliance on these tools, right? Uh, it's... it's 
I, I have a, a crack usually a couple of jokes about that. You know, when you see a funny menu translated, it's so funny when it's funny translated by Google Translate. You usually see the, that quite quickly, right? Uh, it, it becomes a problem where plain dangerous when you know um, news outlets overly rely on on translation tools whether it's google translates or other ones out there and just uh translate wrong things and they gives that to uh for the public to consume right um so there i i, I see uh laziness in that and i think it's uh it, it's something that can be you don't need to be proficient in the language to figure out if a translation, if we're talking about tools, is off, right? In general, what I usually say is if it sounds weird or off, that's probably because it is. And if you're if you're in the business of presenting the news or reporting or doing research, you have to spend some time on that, right? If it sounds weird, it might be an idiom. How do I figure that out? How can I find out if it's an idiom, right? Uh, if we translate some of these idioms literally from whether it's Chinese to English or or French to Spanish, they're going to sound weird. There's typical examples of uh, political text being badly translated, right? Which at the end of the day, get the message out in in a uh, in the wrong way. Okay. Going back to proficiency, um, it's uh, what we often see in 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 in, in core uh, in businesses, uh, corporations, journalists, or other bureaus is that. Every time something is found in Chinese is they usually go to that one person that speaks Chinese and that's going to be the go-to person for Chinese. What you actually can do is you can find a lot of information yourself in Chinese without speaking the language. And then when it's, once it gets really difficult, that's when you pivot to a person that's really proficient in the language telling them, hey, listen, I got so far, I got really far, but now it's getting really too languagey. Can you take it from here, right? <laughs> I see. Well, thank you so much, Skip. We sure. also have a few uh, specific questions on, uh, you know, what data to use to do a certain type of research. Uh, we have a question for DJ on accessing social media data sets such as trending searches or mentions on WeChat, uh, which is a, um, you know, a source of data that is of tremendous interest, especially to social scientists. Um, are there things related to WeChat similar to Google search or Twitter data that researchers can take advantage of, DJ? Absolutely. Yeah, I'd say when it comes to Chinese social media, whatever we have here in the States, elsewhere, there's an equivalent or near equivalent uh, platform in China. So, you know, Baidu is Chinese Google, Weibo is Chinese Twitter, and of course, WeChat is the paramount one-stop shop all social media platform that is widely used in mainland China and frankly around the world as well. I remember using it for virtually everything uh, during my time in China. And uh, if a company is registered in China, for example, it's likely that they have an official account on these platforms, especially WeChat, just like companies do uh, anywhere else in the world. These are pretty interesting sources of biographical and corporate data, I've noticed, especially if that, if that company or individual has been around for a while or is public facing. So for example, Chinese social media has become invaluable in our investigations of Chinese wildlife traffickers in Sub-Saharan Africa, who often use these platforms to communicate with their contacts back in China. So yeah, I'll just say that social media, uh, social media pages, official websites can be quite revealing. Um, regarding specific trends and mentions, um, it's hard for me to say because you can, in theory, use WeChat with a foreign number, not just WeChat, Weibo, uh, another, any other Chinese social media platform. But in order to reap the full benefits of them and to gain full access to WeChat and its services, you need to register for an account uh, with a Chinese phone number. And as I mentioned previously, it's kind of hard to do. Um, a lot of data-rich Chinese websites uh, will allow you to access their data if you register for an account. And you can theoretically do that through a WeChat or Weibo account, but again, only if your account was set up with a Chinese phone number in the first place. And again, you might be wondering, why don't we just go out and get a Chinese SIM card? Well, again, a little easier said than done. You technically have to be in China to get one. They eventually expire, and you need to submit personal identifiers like uh, Shenfen Zheng, passport number uh, if you're a foreigner and stuff like that. So that's a common obstacle we face in this space. 
I see. Well, thank you so much, DJ. Uh, another audience asks about tools to use uh, tools to use to gather information on public traded Chinese companies, aka share companies, and other private companies. Uh, what are the key tools that you rely on that kind of company research, and which ones have become unavailable? Skip, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. So um, during the corporate research section of the course uh, courses, we 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 run. Um, I used to have a quite a, lot, a long list of about six or seven really cool data points like that. I think Tian Sha was there. My favorite was Wei Mao, who could make these really cool graphs of companies and everything. And then once every two or three months, one would dry out. And then at the end of the day, you're, you're ending up with one or two nowadays. They dry out, right? But if there's one thing that they have in common, and I, I, I think uh, it, it's, it's keywords, right? This is the importance of keywords, whether it's corporate research politics or academics or, or, or pharmaceutical things, you, if the identification of a keyword is important. It, it takes time. It's not easy, but it's not impossible, right? Finding vocabulary lists online of people that are enthusiasts in one field uh, can be done. There's a ton of information being posted on, online in English. Actually, English is still the leading language online. It will probably be very different in a few years, but it's still very easy or doable to to find keywords that's one of the things we really emphasize on how to find these keywords right once you have such a keyword pivoting back to corporate research uh if i remember correctly dj mentioned the unified social credit code that's a keyword right if you know how to write that keyword and you know how to write the name of a chinese company you might not end up end up on one of these data points which are drying out but you'll probably end up on the website of the company itself, right? So if these data points dry out, that doesn't mean that websites themselves of companies aren't going to put their data on their website. There are so many websites out there. Uh, many companies are quite keen actually to put uh, business license information as a PDF or in text on their website. And so you have to be creative. And that comes back to a couple of things, finding keywords and being proficient in your Google or Baidu operators. The good news is that these advanced search operators for Google uh, are quite similar to the ones in Baidu. Um, so with a couple of yeah keywords and uh, and your your the mastery of these operators, you, you'll get quite far. And actually, that's one of the things we actually teach you. Not me find stuff and teach you how to get there, but how do you find those keywords? How do you find those data points? Fantastic. We also have an audience who's interested in learning more about intern firm transactions like buyer supplier relationships. Skip, do you have good resources for that kind of research? Um, no, not at the moment. I would pivot. I would very easily, I would just pivot back on what I just said, uh, mm -hmm. finding the right keywords for buyer supplier and then uh, pivoting back, whether it's that field or another field. I see. Well, thank you so much. Uh, finally, we have a few questions on safety concerns. First is about Hong Kong and whether Hong Kong is still a, uh, you know, a workable place in terms of data access. How does Hong Kong compare with mainland China at this point? Is Hong Kong a safe platform to use to access data uh, in mainland China if the data is no longer in mainland China, but it's located in Hong Kong? Uh, DJ or Skip, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I can jump in here. I deal more with data from mainland Chinese sources. However, I have come across some Hong Kong entities in my investigations. I would say that the data in the Hong Kong space, specifically corporate data, is a little bit more accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to data safety and data security while conducting those investigations, I would just do my best to just make sure that that investigation is not tied to any specific sort of individual that may ultimately be put in danger by, for example, using their Chinese phone number to access a high value data set and stuff like that. So I think, you know, knowing the current uh, political and economic climate of China, of greater China, that is, is also good to know um, when operating in this data environment in Hong Kong. Great example of that. I see. I see. Fantastic. Skip, one more question for you. Uh, can you speak to the risk of accessing data through open source data sources uh, in terms of the Chinese government's ability to monitor and track who is looking at what through those sites, um, whether through a subscription service or through a public interface? What's the safety concerns or risks associated with that behavior? 
it really depends on what kind of research you do, actually, if you're just uh, by doing uh, information or if you're researching academic uh, information to further your, your studies or if you work for uh, law enforcement and that you're going to be searching sensitive things, uh, you have to be aware, whether it's China or with another country, uh, you always have to be aware that uh, in principle, what you are looking for, the other side is going to be able to see. So and sometimes there's this saying, I think the whether the, the, the juice is worth the squeeze, you know that you can get to the information, but going to the information and getting that information might actually just put you on the radar. And it's not only applicable to China, but it's, I think it's applicable on uh on the whole scope of the internet. I see, I see. Well, thank you so much, Skip. Final question for DJ. Doing the work that you do now, uh, do you still feel safe that China is in safe option to visit for you? I don't know. I, I'd i love to go back. I had a really great time in China. I learned a lot. It's a great place to learn and grow as a person. Um, I could definitely see myself going back one day. I think. Um, I think we're always trying to build partnerships with foreign governments, especially here at C4ADS. Mm -hmm. I would love to one day, you know, kind of build a bridge uh, between us and them, um, you know, to kind of collaborate on these issue, issues together. Um, but uh, I don't see that being possible in the near future. However, I remain hopeful that it will be one day. I see. And from uh, so what I hear from people on the ground, there's also this growing trend of basically obtaining expert license of, of the data that you, you, you want to use. Currently, it's not fully form formulated in terms of legislation, but in the future, that could be a further trend. If you want to obtain this piece of data, you need to go through this whole administrative process, making sure the data you want to use is safe to use, it's okay to be transferred uh, outside of the country or to be published. And once that process is done, the application is you know, is 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 a sort of crossed off. Then researchers will have more transparent access to the data they want. But I think the legislation on that front is still very much a a moving process. So we'll we'll need to see, uh, you know, sort of the the further actions and movements on that front. And we are close to the end of today's conversation. Thank you so much for joining us today in this super interesting, very insightful discussion on open source intelligence in the context of involving data restrictions in China. And uh, we, myself included, have had the privilege of hearing from true, two true experts on this front, Skip and DJ, um, and they have shared valuable insights and expertise. Please also remember that the conversation we have today doesn't end here if you have further questions or would like to explore those topics in greater length, please uh, feel free to reach out to our panelists or to the China Project team for additional resources. And we are also very excited to announce China Edge, which is a new open source intelligence product powered by the China Project. It provides real data, real-time data over 9 million Chinese companies. I think Bob will have more to say on that front. And also in the coming weeks, there will be further events to continue our discussion today on open source research. I believe the next event uh, is about complying with the new US laws, how to vet Chinese suppliers, cu customers, partners, and investments. And it will be held online the first week of October. So please stay tuned for further updates from the China project team. Once again, thank you so much for being part of this engaging conversation. We look forward to seeing you at further at future uh, webinars and events. Please stay curious and stay informed. Um, Bob, off to you. Thanks so much, Lizzie, DJ, and Skip. That was a fascinating conversation. Uh, I'm going to take just two or three minutes of everyone's time before you drop off to tell you a little bit, uh, a bit more about why we hosted this webinar and we'll be hosting similar ones like it. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Bob Guterma, and I'm the CEO here at the China Project. And this topic of open source intelligence is near and dear to our hearts because it's basically what journalism has become, uh, especially for smaller outfits like us. Uh, it's what most China journalists are forced to do as the number of on the ground reporters uh, and also academic researchers for that matter in China is dwindling and the freedom of those left there is at constant risk. In a world where primary research and on the ground investigation or even human to human interaction, as we heard about during this meeting today, are ever more constrained, open source intelligence is more important than it has ever been. 
about three years ago, we saw this happening to us and our ability to get information and sources in China. And so we began ideating around data products that could solve systemic information gaps between China and the world. And after a couple soft launches and trial projects in recent years, we're excited to announce that we are bringing to market in the next week or two, the newest version of our open source intelligence product called China Edge. It features some of the information we've talked about today, namely the corporate registered details, shareholding structures, directors and officers, operating histories, legal histories, legal alerts, and other official data on more than 9 million Chinese companies. It will include uh, publicly traded companies, private companies, state-owned enterprises. The data will be available in English, real-time updated directly from Chinese public records on a global basis. And uh, perhaps most interestingly related to today's conversation, there was a lot of talk about VPNs and whether what you're doing will be perceptible to the original sources of information. And our product will not require an, a VPN to access. And because of the data channel partners we work with to legally, compliantly, and commercially procure the data, anything you're looking at will be joining a flow of data literally four to five orders of magnitude larger than even what we're doing, let alone what you're doing. And so, quote unquote, what you're looking at won't stick out like a sore thumb, so to speak, or, you know, at least it probably won't. I don't know what you're looking at. But uh, anyway, the, the point is that it, uh, it, that in and of itself will be a feature of the product that you will be uh, firewalled, for lack of a better term, from the th places you're looking at. So we're going to be uh, reaching out to all of you in the coming weeks to see if any of you would be interested in taking a, a tour of the new product that we're launching. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to continue to hold this series of events uh, on this topic or topics like it to continue to connect, inform, and provide solutions to researchers who are facing difficulties conducting open source research on China. As Lizzie mentioned, the next event is called Complying with New US, New U.S. Laws, How to Vet Chinese Suppliers, Customers, Partners, and Investments, parentheses, without breaking Chinese laws. And it will take place uh, in the first week or so of October. We'll send you the specific date uh, in the next day or two here. And it will go a level deeper than this into specific process and methodology, depending on what you're looking at. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you to our speakers. And we look forward to hearing from or speaking with all of you soon. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. you so much.